has taken over. Let's go. It's Pharrell. Coast to coast. Steaks, chicks, stacks. You and I are going to make a lot of money. It's Pharrell. Coast to coast. Anyway, Carver High, I just wanted to say, I watched the uh, McEnroe documentary on uh, Showtime. I don't know if you knew that was out, but it's out now. And it's really long. It's like almost two hours. But uh, I have to tell you, it was just phenomenal. I mean, it really was incredible, especially if you're, you know, I guess of age to have experienced John McEnroe play. If you saw him uh, his whole career from the age of 18 on, um, he was my favorite uh, player in the world, uh, bar none. I loved him uh, with his wooden racket. I, I played the game. I did everything uh, that he did. I used the wooden rackets. I, I wanted to, to be him. I wanted to play tennis because of him. It was the same reason he became a tennis player was because of Bjorn Borg. Uh, he was in, uh, infatuated with Borg's rock star, uh, you know, following he was literally uh, a phenomena and and literally the most famous tennis player in the world he was a supermodel guy that women wanted everywhere he went he got chased by millions of women and paparazzi he couldn't leave his own house it ruined him he quit the sport at 25 uh because of his uh fame and he was such a quiet guy the swede right but uh mcenroe when he played on without him uh, he said the rest of his career was meaningless without Bjorn Borg uh, playing against him in majors. Uh, he talked about everyone, his uh, friendship with Gary Elitis, how much he hated Jimmy Connors. Uh, he called Connors every name in the book in this documentary. I mean, you, literally at C word, he called him everything. And Jimmy Connors probably has the worst reputation of being a stuck up ass hat in the history of the sport. He was the most snobby, uh, guy ever. And he's still that guy to this day. Won't cooperate with anyone. Won't do interviews. Won't be nice to anyone. He's just a P. And uh, it, this documentary will blow your mind if you like John McEnroe, if you hate John McEnroe. And it talks about him being a father, his marriages to Tatum O'Neill and Patty Smythe, uh, being a dad uh, with his son, with Tatum, his daughter with Smythe. Uh, what he's like living in New York. And now he's become the most famous tennis broadcaster ever, more than Bud Collins, uh, more than Cliff Drysdale, more than anyone. Uh, he is tennis. And it is amazing to me. It's like A-Rod in baseball. The guy cheated and did roids and is the most uh, famous guy in baseball. And then McEnroe was the bad boy of tennis, nothing but trouble. He used to hock her on paparazzi. He'd spit on him. He literally come out of a hotel and drop a lube right on your face. And he got in every kind of skirmish known to man. I got to tell you, I watched this thing. Not only was it badass, but the music that they play, because he's a rocker, he plays guitar. The music that they played in, I don't know if you saw my tweet that they played Johnny Rotten's Public Image Limited at the end of the documentary when the credits rolled. I mean, this was one of the best documentaries I think I've ever seen in my life. It sounds like a very good one. I will have to check it out. And we do have to remember, nobody is bigger than Cliff Drysdale, especially on Coast to Coast. <laughs> nobody is bigger than Cliff. Uh, what a weekend for him with the Martinis watching our guy Nick Kyrgios get right. to the uh, quarters tonight where he's like Over a minus 440 favorite against some guy. Yeah, beat him for the second time this year. This Hey, if he's ever going to win a major... It's wide open for him right now. He got rid of Medvedev. Right. The big three aren't going to be there for the rest of the week. This is Kyrgios' chance to and, win big. And Berrettini yeah. lost today to Rude. Rude's yep. playing great yep. tennis. I have a feeling Rude's going to be there as well, at least in the semis. Uh, we welcome in all of our radio affiliates for El Coast to Coast on a Tuesday, Sirius XM 159, Sports Map, Sports Byline. Good to have everybody with us today. All right, let's fly through some of this baseball. Later, we'll do all the games tonight. Blue Jays swept that doubleheader in Baltimore, Scotty. Bad news for the Orioles. They're now four and a half back. Bo Bichette had three homers in game number two. We got to at least hear this on Sportsnet in Toronto. Behind where the Blue Jays are. As Bichette cranks another one. Deep left center. It's gone! A three-home run game 
for Bo Bichette. Man, oh man. Man, oh man. I mean, uh, they're just playing great. 11 of 12 on the road, and they are as dangerous a team uh, going towards October that there is in baseball. I've said this to you from the very beginning of the season that the Blue Jays line up with those bats and decent pitching that they are going to be a player in this postseason. And they're playing better baseball, I think, right now than just about anybody in the game except the Dodgers. Uh, the Rays continue to win. They beat the Red Sox 4-3. They were down in that game, Scotty. Peralta put them ahead in the seventh. They gave Enrique Hernandez a one-year extension. Brewers needed a three-run shot from Victor Caratini to beat the Rockies 6-4. to uh, The Nationals beat the Cardinals, as we spoke about. Sunday, Scotty, Pujols hit number 695. So we're five away we want to get over We want to get that 700, Sky, to get that big ticket that we got on pools. We need five more in the next few weeks. I think we're going to get there. What about you? I think we're going to get there with pool holes easily in 28 games, and I think we're going to get there, as I've already said today, with Judge needing eight. I think we're going to sweat pool holes, man, but I, I think he's going to get there, but I think we're going to sweat it all the way into those final couple of days. Why uh, would we? He's been hitting a home run every single week. He, he has. I just, I I don't know. I just feel like the bottom's going to fall out at any time on this run that he's had. Ye of little faith. The early line. That MVP award here at 14 to 1. He's in one of those spaces where if Russell Wilson just stayed in Seattle, yeah, it's Russ, he dominates. What do you want from him? But if he moves over to the Denver Broncos and they win the AFC West, and Russell Wilson is the reason that you're going to win the AFC West, I think you get a little bit more points on the bulletin board in order to get that done. So I like that 14 to 1 as well. There's a lot to like about Russell Wilson. We're expecting big things here, and I think he does some damage in some of those props. Only on Sports Grid. Pharrell, coast to coast. In fact, if you said to me, give me your top three teams you like to beat the odds. Phillies one, the Panthers are two at six and a half, and I'm going to shock you with this one. I still like the Jets over five and a half. I know that their schedule is really tough to start. Last time I checked, it's a 17-game season, folks. Don't overreact to early season schedules. They've upgraded severely that roster. They will absolutely be better than five and a half wins. The Sports Grid Network. In game live. They're going to get Alvin Kamara for the entirety of the season. No suspension. They get Michael Thomas back a wide receiver who didn't play last year. They have Chris Olave. And I think you have to feel very confident about them not just making the playoffs, but winning this division. I would also look at the success that the Saints had last year. You might say that the Bucks should be the favorite. But from a betting standpoint, there are so many reasons why you should invest in the New Orleans Saints. Catch the program every single day on the Sports Grid Network. I don't know how it's going to work out for him, but I just don't see him being on the field nearly as much as he was last season. Maybe the touchdown numbers will, will have him in that tight end one category. Earlier in his career, he would have gotten out. I mean, I guess he had 108 rushing yards, but six rushing touchdowns in his career. So it doesn't give you any upside there. Carr, to be honest, for me, just is not a guy I ever end up targeting. Fantasy Sports Today, only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less. Rogers and the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell, coast to coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley Cups over there. Give me the game practice. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game live I all like access. Mandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a four and a In half. game oh, live man. prime oh, man, time. In game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid.
All right, Rick Haro is our sports uh, legal insider and all sports business guru of choice on the network and on Coast to Coast. And he's back on today to talk about a number of things. I already said on the show earlier that uh, the McEnroe uh, documentary on Showtime, I don't know if you saw it, Rick, but it is absolutely phenomenal. And you experienced this guy's entire career from uh, coming up in New York at 18 and what he went through losing to Connors and, and Borg in the early stages of his career. And then what he did in the rivalry with Borg and then eventually beating up on Connors multiple times, taking over tennis for four years. He was number one in the world and won 155 singles and doubles titles, a record that stands today. Uh, and he's the voice of tennis. I mean, I was blown away by the documentary. It was phenomenal. Now we're watching a guy, and I hope you watch it. It is well worth the two hours. And then and now we're watching a guy that's in his spitting image in Nick Kyrgios, a hothead, a temper, a troublemaker, a bad boy uh, with his uh, treatment of everyone, the umpires, crowds, fans, media. Uh, he is uh, nothing but bad news. But boy, do I love rooting for him. As much as I loved rooting for McEnroe, he was always my favorite. Just watch the ratings. Watch the ratings every other night when he plays all week. Serena carried week one. He carries week two. And the one thing he has that McEnroe didn't is social media. The one thing McEnroe had that he doesn't is he can't argue line calls. McEnroe could. <laughs> now what's he going to argue about? So he talks to himself now, which is great. Uh, it's going to uh, buttress the business of sports psychologists all over the world. But I will tell you with him, not to say they're the same personality, but if you're looking for two faces of men's tennis in the next 10 years, my bet is on Tiafo and Kyrgios. I'll tell you what, uh, Tiafo was unbelievable against Nadal. Uh, he dominated him, I thought, uh, yesterday. And you can see in the end, Nadal finally hit a wall and just frankly, yeah. he knew it was over and he was going to lose. And he just, he just let him do it. It, it. In like those final three games, you could tell he knew he couldn't beat him. The guy was hitting the ball way too hard, way too fast from all angles. And Nadal's serve was so bad. He was doomed. He couldn't, he double faulted like 10 times. Yeah, but and here was here was the interesting thing. Uh, they respect each other. They really do. Although, uh, you know, Tiafo wanted to give him a hug. He pushed him away. No man hugs, okay? You won your match. Go, go cheer. It's exciting. Thank you for elevating men's tennis. I'm just not ready to hug you today. And Nadal has something left in him. I really think so. I'm not sure about Federer. I'm not sure whether Djokovic is ever going to come back to the U.S., unless the uh, vaccination policies are changed. But I do think Nadal has a couple of U.S. Opens left in him. I think his uh, time ran out at Wimbledon with the core muscle injury. And then yeah, he maybe. never played tennis until the U.S. Open. Yeah. And he looked good. But he was not in the shape that he was when he left right. Roland Garros and went to London. He had it all going in London. I think he would have won Wimbledon until he tore his muscle in his stomach. And I think that ruined his season. Yeah, you know what's important in all of this from a business perspective is that ESPN signed that 10-year, uh, 770, 11-year, $770 million deal with ESPN and the U.S. Tennis Association in 2014. And we're up against the end of it right now. What a great time to start negotiating. CBS dropped it for $30 million a year. That was nowhere near uh, the ESPN bid. Boy, they wish they had it back, but ESPN is not going to give it up. All right, let's talk about uh, the college football playoff expansion. What do you know? Well, what I know is that the presidents took it over. It was 11-0 unanimous. Now they leave it to their COOs of athletics, their athletic directors, to quote-unquote work out the details. They don't want to be bothered. All they want to do is to say, we're going to have 12 teams. We understand what the format's going to be. We're going to have buys. Then we're going to have on-campus games in that first round. It's going to be really exciting. And everybody's talking about 2026. What we don't realize is the fine print, which is there are contracts that expire in 2026, but there's more money to be made the earlier you make them expire and start new ones. So my bet is that it happens earlier than 2026, maybe 25, maybe 24. How about uh, the NFL television ratings? They're about to explode this week. 
Well, let's put it this way. We have 17 and a half million people who watch regular season games. That's up 10% over the year before. It's 220 million people, you know, watching the Super Bowl. We're now over 220 million people. That's an incredible number, even though some say that's too high, but nobody really quibbles about it because it's juggernaut. 48 of the top 50 shows on television, NFL games. So we understand how big that is. I'm watching two Thursday nights from now because the Amazon streaming deal, that's when a lot of people are going to realize they tune out, tune in conventional networks. Where's the game? <laughs> well, they got to go find it. And that means that streaming numbers will be off the charts this year as well. Yeah, I have to say I have my reservations about whether or not a lot of people are going to sign up for Amazon for NFL games and pay the freight to watch a football game. I think they might get burned on that deal because now you got to pay for everything. You got to pay for every single streaming service. People have 10, 12 different streaming services going. They're paying another 200 bucks a month total for all those and their cable bill and their electric bill and their mortgage. And people are going to realize when they have to trim the fat, the first thing they're going to trim is all those streaming services they don't watch. Yeah, maybe, except if I'm wanting the Thursday night game and I want to have all the access to an incredible movie library and old TV shows and I get access to Amazon delivery rates, maybe I trim other fat. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that the marketing directors get paid for way beyond my pay grade. I don't take that kind of risk because I think by two or three Thursdays from now, we're going to be right or wrong. Everybody doesn't talk about the number of people tuning in, but the real number is who has subscribed to Amazon that didn't subscribe in early September. I want to know, maybe next week you can find out who uh, is like winning those you know, uh, Apple TV, baseball, Friday night yeah. games, uh, the prime games on Amazon that the Yankees are on some nights. I want to know who is actually watching those games and what those ratings are, because I just I, I think most New Yorkers are furious. They have to go uh, pay Apple Plus and pay prime to watch the Yankees. I think the Yankees should be on cable every single game, every single night, the entire season. The fact that you have to pay for that now, I think is absolute BS. Who's going to get the licenses in Massachusetts for sports books? Oh, it's down to only 40 of your closest friends. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be all the traditional guys, uh, the FanDuel, DraftKings, the Caesars, BetMGM, all the people we know. And then there will be uh, Suffolk Downs and some of the other racetracks that have earned the equity because they've been around for so long. Then some other groups that will come out of left field at the last minute. But it's following the usual deal. First, there are the moral issues. Don't do it. Then that becomes forget it because we have the economics and infrastructure. Then we've got a deadline. Then it narrowly passes. Then the governor creates a timeline to sign up for X months from now, and then everybody starts hopping on. It's not a question in Massachusetts, as we know, of if anymore. It's a question of when, and it's long overdue. Why did crypto get out of the Champions League? Well, some would say they're running out of money, but, uh, you know, we have on our podcast a uh, uh, kind of shameless plug this week, uh, Lee Zeidman, and we also have on the record show this week, he's the guy that runs Crypto.com Arena, and he talks about how important that sponsorship is in the future. And it is interesting because the crypto business, we would all agree, is not as strong and robust in September as it was at Super Bowl time last February. So let's see where that goes. It was a major bet to spend $750 million for Staples Center. It's a big bet to get out of this deal, and they may have gotten out of it just in time, although we'll see. All right, uh, real quick, uh, I'll just say that uh, the Yankees bought a piece of AC Milan, the soccer club, and BetMGM got a deal with the Kansas City Chiefs because now you can bet in Kansas and Missouri, and so that's yep. a great deal for the Chiefs and BetMGM. You got it. Rick, great stuff. We'll see you again next week. Thank you. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. In the landscape of college sports, some things remain the same. College football today. Of Alabama in winning SEC 
defending champion. It's the island of misfit tour. Fantasy sports so, today. You have to understand that. Can they survive those first four games? They go two and two. Pro football two. today. To this franchise, they are comical. Now, I'm not making light of the injury. This is a brutal rash. In-game live you can take all the points. access. You can take the money line. In a sports book, if you shop around, you can get it at 133. But um, that's my best bet on the night, Joe. So that's the one I'm going big. In I'm game go. live, prime time. I'm a bit nostalgic. I'm going with an international, Jason Day and Sergio Garcia. But boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination? Get the winning edge only on Sports Grid, your 24/7 sports wagering network. In game line. Chiefs can win that division. Broncos can win that division. Chargers can win the division. And I got to say something, Harrison. Raiders look good to me. That's the whole thing. Everybody's good there. Who has the best schedule is clearly the Broncos. Only the Broncos are getting the Jets, my friend. Oh, not, not the Chiefs, not the Raiders. And so then I looked at week 18. They get the home field game against the Chargers. And I said, hey, right now, I got him at plus 275. I had to roll with the Broncos to win that division. Catch the program every single day and on the Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. When you're looking at Kyle Pitts, you're looking at a generational special talent. You're looking at a tight end who hit 110 targets last year. Don't you think if he gets 115 this year or 120, he's probably going to catch closer to 80 in year two and probably not have the one touchdown? He was still tight end seven last year in standard leagues, and he was tight end five in half PPR. Kyle Pitts is a player, Matt, that I think people don't quite understand exactly yet how special he is. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. There are some teams, Scott, that rely solely on analytics. There are some teams that are behind in analytics and rely a lot more on scouting. And then there are the Dodgers who really have that combination going. They've really figured out how to maximize every plate appearance. I don't see the Mets beating them. I don't care if they have four DeGroms. I, I think the Dodgers are going to the World Series. The Sports Grid Network. You got to get the BetMGM app to get great deals like betting 10 bucks on any baseball game. You win 200 if either team hits a home run. All you have to do is use the bonus code MLBHR2022. That's MLBHR2022, the year we're in. Bet 10 bucks on any game, win 200 if either team hits a home run. All right, Carver, hi. We got a lot of baseball games tonight, at least uh, ones that haven't been washed already on the East Coast. Uh, we certainly do have a lot of games. A uh, couple of leftover things I'll quickly throw at you. Cease lost that no-hitter on Saturday against the Twins with two outs in the ninth. What a bummer. Otani homered twice yesterday. Trout hit his 30th. Angels actually won a game. Oscar Gonzalez had a huge hit for the Guardians. They got an extra inning win over the Royals. Max Scherzer left his start on Saturday, feeling fatigued on his left side. Looks like he that was precautionary, and he's going to be okay. Uh, now we will get to tonight's game, Scotty, in baseball. We will start at PNC, where the Mets and the Buccos could not get together yesterday. Rained out. They will try again tonight, then play a doubleheader tomorrow. Taiwan Walker against Mitch. Yes, call me Helen Keller. Uh, Mets minus 225 at PNC. Buccos plus 185, total of eight. Yeah, you know, I like the over in the Mets. I just don't see any scenario where they're not teeing off on Helen Keller tonight in Pittsburgh. The Red Sox are at the trop again against the Rays tonight. They have Rich Hill going for them. Uh, Chargios goes for the Rays, minus 135 for Tampa, plus 110 for Boston. Seven and a half is the total. Well, I thought Rasmussen was supposed to start against Hill, so I was on the yeah. Rays. 
Uh, I got to tell you, I got no problem taking a stab at a buck 40 with the Red Sox tonight against uh, Chargios, whoever the hell that is. The guy's pitched seven innings the whole year. Uh, I'll take a shot with the Red Sox, even though I was on the Rays at the beginning of the day because of Rasmussen. I was leaning on that 140 all day, wondering if I should go for it with the Red Sox. The last time Hill faced him last week, he struck out 11 Rays. So I, I might take a flyer on them tonight at a buck 40. The Fish are in Philadelphia to play the Phillies tonight. Marlins and the Phillies. Jesus Lazardo against Aaron Nola. Phillies heavy lumber minus two twenty-five. Marlins plus a buck eighty. Total of seven in this one. How about that number? I- I'm going to take a shot at the under with the Phillies. Both of these guys. Lazardo hasn't been bad at all with a three-four ERA, and uh, Nola uh, same thing, right? So maybe it'll be a good pitching matchup. Keep it under. I like the Phillies in a close one. Orioles and the Jays again tonight. Orioles need this one bad, or they're going to fall five and a half back in that wild card. White against Bradish is the pitching matchup at Camden. Minus 110 each way, Scotty. Total eight and a half. This is the hardest game of the day for me because, uh, you know, I was looking at it and I thought, uh, all right, can the Orioles and Bradish beat this team? For me, they're just too hot, uh, Mike. 11 of 12 on the road. They swept the doubleheader. Why would I not go back with them? Because it was the matchup with White and Bradish. I don't believe in White at all. But I do believe in the Jays' bats right now, the way they're playing on the road every day, winning every game they play. 11 of 12 on the road. How do I get away from that? I don't. Reds and the Cubbies playing out the string uh, for the next few weeks at Wrigley tonight. Done against Wade Miley. Uh, Cubbies minus 150. Reds plus a buck 25. Seven and a half the total. I mean, where has Wade Miley been, right? Like he's pitched 19 <laughs> innings the whole year. Uh, I'm going to go with the Cubs here for no reason whatsoever. I wouldn't touch this game with a 10 foot pole. Nationals have been playing a lot better, as we've said. They're in St. Louis again tonight against the Cardinals. Jose Quintana goes for the Redbirds. Espino for the Nats. Big lumber here, minus 250 for the St. Louis. Total of eight. I'm going to go over, and I'll take uh, Quintana, the left-hander, against Espino. And the reason is Espino is is just bad luck. I mean, he's god-awful. He never wins. He hasn't won a game the whole year. So... The Nats are playing well, though, so I'm hoping that you get a lot of runs in this one. I'd rather bet the total over eight than I would either side. Guardians and the Royals again tonight. Guardians, the big extra inning win a night ago. Have Shane, don't call me Justin Bieber, going against Bubich tonight for the Royals, who, as we know, Scotty, not very good. Minus 200 for Cleveland, total seven and a half in this one. I'm going over here. Bubik hairs on the mound. He's two and ten. He's awful. Bieber's going to eat him up. I got Cleveland and, and a lot of runs. Framber Valdez goes for the Astros tonight against the Rangers. C Otto gets the ball for them. Minus two seventy five for Houston. Plus two twenty for the Rangers. Seven and a half is the total. Yeah, look, I need the Astros to score runs, and I need them to win this game by a couple runs. And so I'm all over Houston here in the over. Brewers and the Rockies at Coors Field tonight. Brandon Woodruff against Chad. You're so cool. Brewers minus 190. Rockies plus a buck 55. Total of 11. I just think uh, Woodruff's too tough. I still like the Brewers here in the thin air tonight. Angels looking to win again. They have the Tigers in town. Myers goes against Eduardo Rodriguez, who, of course, has been in and out of the lineup all year for Detroit. Uh, Angels minus 130. Tigers plus 105. Eight the total in that one. Another uh, pair of teams I don't want anything to do with. I think the Tigers have already got the glad bags out. They're, uh, you know, packing it in for the season. Give me the Angels. Good pitching matchup uh, tonight between the Diamondbacks and the Padres. Merrill Kelly against Joe Musgrove. Padres minus 165, plus a buck 40 for Arizona. Total of flat seven at Betco. I was tempted uh, to go for it. Like uh, on Kelly, I told you earlier, I'm going to stay under here and take Musgrove and the Padres. I don't think they lose four straight at Petco. 
Kyle Wright goes for the Braves tonight, Scotty. They are in Oakland to take on the Athletics. In fact, he's going for his 18th win. Cole Irvin for the A's at the Ashtray. Braves are minus 225, total of eight. How do I get off the Braves? They've won five in a row and Wright 17 and five. I'm on the Braves, and I think they'll beat Irvin easily. Johnny Cueto and Gilbert Grape up in Seattle. White Sox and the Mariners. Mariners, Scotty, minus 155, plus 125 for the Sox. Seven and a half the total. I hit an uh, incredible bet yesterday with the White Sox winning uh, there in the first game of that series, 3-2. to two, And I think Seattle had the bases loaded there in the ninth inning. It was very stressful. I'm going to go Gilbert Grape here in Seattle over the White Sox tonight. Uh, in in the Pacific Northwest. Give me the M's. And finally, the heavy lumber of the night uh, is in Los Angeles where Dodgers try to bounce back after losing to the Giants last night, Scotty. Tyler Anderson will go for them. Uh, Brebbia goes for the Giants. Minus 350 for L.A., plus 260 for San Francisco. Eight and a half is the total. Yeah, I mean, they're 10-4 and four against the Giants this year, so I'm all over the Dodgers uh, tonight in this game. And then uh, I'm going to go under here because I think Anderson's going to put on a show, and Rebia hasn't been bad at all with his ERA in the 56 innings of work. So I'm going to take a stab at the under, but I'm still on the Dodgers. There you go. That is your night, Scotty, in Major League Baseball. Let's cash lots of tickets with the games and with the lion's share. I do have time to give you the standings. I told you that I would give them to you if I did. American League East, which we've been looking at closely, of course, recently, uh, is now Yankees a five-game lead over the Rays, four In the loss column. So the Yankees with 54 losses. The Rays have 58 now. And Toronto is in the conversation too, Scotty. They are five and a half back, five in the loss as we hit the final few weeks of the season. I just still can't even fathom that uh, the lead is shrunk to five from 15 and a half on July 8th. (laughs) And I, I told you, I thought the Rays would sweep them in Tampa over the weekend. They took two of three. Bases uh, on second and third with two outs in the night. Bad call. That was a ball four. Would have loaded the bases. They would have had a shot to sweep the series and wake up today three back. Instead, it's five. And I do think that uh, Toronto's playing better baseball than Tampa. I can't believe we're having this conversation, uh, honestly, in the first week of September with the first three months of the year that the Yankees had. In the AL Central, Seems like nobody wants to win. Every time somebody looks like they're getting a little bit of separation, they lose three out of four, have a bad weekend. The Guardians, Scotty, have a one-game lead over the Twins, and now just a two-game lead over the White Sox. Every time we throw dirt on the White Sox, they're still alive, Scotty. They still have a chance. They have a better chance of that, the Central, than they do a wild card, which I think their chances are nil. But I have no idea who's going to win this division because I think all three of them are fair to Midland. They are all fair to Midland, and you are absolutely right about the wild card chances now of those teams that don't win the Central. As you will see here, the separation is now very clear, Scotty. Rays, Mariners, and Blue Jays all Four and a half up on the Orioles, who are the next closest. Then the Twins. Then the White Sox, who are seven and a half. I think our three wildcard teams, at the minimum, are starting to come into focus here. Particularly if the Orioles lose tonight and it's five and a half when they wake up tomorrow. Uh, No question about that. The other one I'll give you is the NL East because it is just one. Mets have a one-game lead on the Braves uh, after losing two out of three to the Nationals this weekend. I mean, I I can't even fathom that Scherzer and DeGrom and Diaz and this Mets team can't get rid of the Braves. It smells like the Braves are going to take them. They're definitely going to win tonight, I think. Uh, But I think the Braves are uh, sort of that. might be the next daily fantasy millionaire. No matter what you watch, 
or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Fantasy Sports Today. Her cousins threw for 4,000 yards last year, 33 touchdowns. Essentially, he is a fantastic super flex quarterback. To have him as your number one super flex is fantastic. Do you see any drop back for him? I mean, Kirk Cousins has been a very good fantasy quarterback. I, I don't know if I would draft Cousins as a starter simply because I want to have a guy who can run, but I think he's a good option. The Sports Grid Network. The morning after. There are four of the five teams in the American League East in contention for American League playoff spots at the moment. And it's not the Red Sox, as we all assumed it would be entering the season. It's the Baltimore Orioles. Because when was the last time we could say the O's were even in postseason contention? At this time, to start off the month of September, the Baltimore just keeps sticking around, keeps winning baseball games. And the Baltimore Orioles have been incredible. The Sports Grid Network. A-Rod, Clemens, Pettit, Bonds, McGuire, Sosa. Get ready, because that soup is served ice cold. From a betting perspective for the 2022 NFL season, if I'm betting on the 49ers in the futures market, I want Jimmy G on this roster because that instantly becomes one of the best backups he's taken to the Niners to the Super Bowl. Pharrell, coast to coast, only on SportsGrid. Sports professor Rick Haro inside the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your Sports News Minute. Scene shifts to the West Coast with a joint venture that will benefit Sacramento. Sacramento Kings, Sacramento River Cats joining forces to take advantage of the synergies in sports marketing in that community. The Savage family, a very successful entrepreneurial group that created a ballpark in Sacramento that helped downtown development. And Vivek Ranadive, the owner of the Sacramento Kings, certainly has generated significant support. Remember when they were the Kansas City Omaha Kings and then the Kansas City Kings went to Sacramento, questionable possibilities. They've succeeded as much in the market, not necessarily on the floor. But the bottom line is both companies bring their assets to the state capital. And with gambling soon to be approved, the sky is the limit for a city that has a major league team and one that acts like one as well. Sports Professor Ricaro, Sports News Minute. All right, for all back on Coast to Coast, Adam Kaplan is our NFL insider and regular contributor here on Coast to Coast, and you see him all over Sports Grid. Uh, and he's on Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays usually with us during the NFL season. Of course, yesterday being Labor Day, hope you had a good holiday. He's on today. He'll be on again Thursday and Friday this week, I believe. So uh, let's start with the Steelers. No surprise to any of us here that yeah. Trubisky got the job. Uh, are you surprised at all uh, that Pickett is the number two and Rudolph the number three? Did any of it surprise you at all? No, but there's a lot to unpack here. First of all, I have to give Mike Tomlin credit. I, I covered this business for 20 years, and you know this at quarterback. When you completely open up a competition between three quarterbacks, it generally means you don't have one guy that you like. So you open it up, and I have to tell you, if I'm talking to people there, it brought out the best of all three. Even Mason Rudolph, who, who more or less had been somewhat of a disappointment over his career, never really pushed for a starting job there uh, against Roethlisberger, even when Ben was struggling. But it, it, this brought out the best of him. Matter of fact, Pickett, who started training camp as the third, you saw him start to really play well in the preseason, whereas training camp, maybe a little reluctant to throw the ball downfield, which they're going to do more of uh, now that they've moved on from Roethlisberger to Trubisky because Trubisky's got a good arm. But it actually brought out the – the, the best in the competition. In fact, Trubisky, he had the small advantage going to the, the final preseason game. He clearly won it with that that performance. He was really good there. And, you know, I was telling you, uh, uh, you know, a little while ago about how well he did in Buffalo from the Bills telling me behind the scenes. 
as their number two quarterback last year, they were really surprised at how good he looked because, you know, it didn't it didn't end well for him in Chicago. So Trubisky now is clearly the starter. And I give Mike Tomlin credit. But the question here is for Alfred Tomlin is, how patient will he be with Pickett, the only first-round quarterback this year, waiting in the wings? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, it's because uh, Trubisky has been there, done that, experienced first-team NFL offense, defense, being a franchise player, which is what he was in Chicago when they drafted him at that high uh, at number two. So, and I don't blame him for what happened in Chicago. Uh, I blame that front office and that coaching staff and the fact that they didn't have anybody around him. They really didn't. They had Robinson, who they never uh, made happy. He left. He's with the Rams now. They brought in Khalil Mack, who was already toast. uh, And now he's playing somewhere else and you're going to see even less of him. But they blame Trubisky for everything in Chicago. And meanwhile, he took him to two playoff runs. How about blame Eddie Pinero for that shank kick in that playoff game from 25 yards out? And blame Mooney for the drop at a flea flicker bomb in New Orleans. They blame Mitchell Trubisky for everything. You haven't gotten over that drop. You, you mentioned that like 20 times from last year. Do you get over the drop of Tart in the Niners playoff game? Yeah, I'm not getting yeah. over that. Did they? They got rid of him. Yeah, no doubt. And you wanted, you still want, you still want uh, Higgins, the receiver, to get the ball more. Uh, you were disappointed in the playoffs. In the, well, of course I do. Yeah, or the Super Bowl, rather. But look, the fact of the matter is, Trubisky is their starter. And this is uncharted water here for Mike Tomlin because he only knows Ben Roethlisberger as a starter for his entire tenure. There's got to be patience here with Trubisky. Now, w- one thing I would tell you that the reason, the reason, or reasons why. Trubisky never really made it long-term despite making the playoffs as a starting quarterback two of the four years. It's the inexplicable mistake at the wrong time. Just stay within structure. You know, he's a pretty good athlete, good enough size, has a good arm. They just have to understand things are going to happen. When he makes a mistake, don't make the same mistake twice. Don't force the football. They've got the running game, and they love George Pickens, who's been an unbelievable story. I'm told here with George Pickens, their second-round second receiver out of Georgia, Right. Did well, not with just Trubisky. With everyone he worked with, he kicked butt. He's a breakout player as a rookie here for the Steelers, and they're going to be a fun football team. Look for this offense to be more wide open here from the changeover from Roethlisberger to, to Trubisky in his first year as a starter. And by the way, Trubisky, a two-year deal worth $14.3 million. To get to the second year, which is no guaranteed money, he's going to have to play well. Do you think his leash will be short and tight and any failure at all will lead to uh, an exit from that job and Pickett getting uh, thrown into the wolves? Because I also don't think that's uh, fair. That's the big question. And I'm going to say this, because this is, again, uncharted water here for the head coach, Mike Tomlin. I do believe he'll be patient because this is a guy and Mitch Trubisky, he was very high on. He, this is a guy that he didn't make the call here. The front office did, but he liked that move. And I'll also tell you, he he he's a big Kenny Pickett guy um, because obviously playing at Pitt, he he saw him at the, playing in the same stadium as they play at at home, so he was very familiar with the player. And they know Pickett's their start of the future. That's not in question. I do believe to answer your question, and ser- obviously it's the number one question: is how patient will be. I would expect him to. He has carte blanche. Tomlin, nobody gets involved from the front office standpoint ownership. They let him do what he wants. And Tomlin will do the right thing here. But the question will be, and we'll talk more about this on Thursday, is what could this team do now with the change of quarterback? Will they be a better football team? Nice defense, not great in the secondary. The offensive line's a little bit shaky. But when you have an athletic quarterback, a younger quarterback like Trubisky, who's been through a lot now, he's been through everything you can imagine, being benched, being told he's in the next guy in Chicago, then for being taken away from him, then I go to Buffalo to revive his career. This is a situation absolutely that bears watching. Do you think they'll uh, give the Bengals a good game on Sunday in Cincinnati? I expect it to be high scoring. Now, understand a couple of things here. Offensively, typically the defenses are ahead of the offenses early on, particularly week one. That's where it's going to be interesting because the Bengals are kind of banged up then in the last season into the playoffs. The Bengals have four new starters on their offensive line. Joe Burrow is not coming back now from an injury. He was rehabbing last summer. Now he, he's he's not rehabbing anything. They're good to go on offense. Nice defense. Their secondary has been replenished. They're going to be good. 
but they're not going to shock anyone like last year. Every year there's a team that comes out of nowhere who is worse and then goes to first. My pick this year, and we'll, get, we'll talk more about this on Thursday, as I, I told you on Monday, is going to be Denver to go from seven wins to win that AFC West. I know you think I'm out of my mind, but the Steelers could bounce back here. They're going to be a little bit more competitive because I expect this offense under, under Matt Canada, who was kind of restricted by what he had to do with Roethlisberger because he only likes the offense a certain way. They're going to be more wide open, and I, I look forward to seeing what they do this week against the Bengals. All right, let's talk about Matt Stafford as they get ready for this yeah. game with the Bills, the Thursday night opener at SoFi for the NFL pain day season. Yeah, so Stafford, I happened to be there the day, Pharrell, when Stafford was shut down in training camp with his right elbow tendonitis. He's, he's good to go. It, it, there's residual soreness here. When they have to, they'll back off. He took all the first team reps. They didn't limit him this week. And... He's firing on all cylinders. They didn't practice him a ton in training camp. He's ready to go. He told the media this. He, he's ready to go. As I understand it, from talking to one really plugged-in team source there, looks really good. But what happens is, Pharrell, and you know this is going to be a passing offense, you got to see how this looks on Thursday night. It gets a team they're going to have to throw against in the Buffalo Bills. Let's see how it looks when you could actually get rushed and tackled and, and pressured. Now, they're probably, as I understand, not going to have Van Jefferson, their number three receiver. He had knee surgery earlier in August. Uh, I'm told there there's some also some cartilage that had to be repaired. So uh, I put him in the doubtful category. He hasn't practiced this week. Today was the last day of practice. Tomorrow's a walkthrough. So it, it's doubtful he'll be able to play. Ben Skoranek will fill in for him. And in this game on Thursday, we'll talk more about it, but I'll give you one nugget here. Look for Tyler Higby, who set an NFL record in 2019, four consecutive 100-yard games. Look for his role to grow a little bit in the passing game until Van Jefferson comes back because they're just not very deep at wide receiver. And Tyler Higby is a super athletic tight end. I don't know why they don't use him more as they did in 2019, but they will use him more until he returns. And also in this game, this is you mentioned Allen Robinson. This is his debut. This is a home game, obviously. And uh, I'm interested to see how they use him here. Cooper Cup is obviously their, their slot receiver. This The former staff, I'm told, in Chicago wanted to move him permanently to the slot because they didn't think he was explosive as he used to be. So keep an eye on that. But the bottom line is, when you look at this team, this is going to be a great matchup. I cannot wait for it. I mean, Robinson, Cup, and Higby, who cares about Jefferson when you got talent like that three ways on the offense? Stafford should be able to do whatever he wants. And then the Bills secondary is missing their top player, and they're starting some rookie uh, sixth rounder no one's ever heard of. Yeah, so this is, this is fascinating. So... You know, matchups are everything in the National Football League. The Bills are going to have Jordan Poyer, their start uh, safety, who hurt his elbow in the preseason. He, he's good to go. But their top corner, Tredavious White, depending on who you speak with, he's a top five to top seven corner in the National Football League. If you might recall, he suffered a torn ACL in their Thanksgiving game. He's in practice since last season. He's, he's just not ready yet. So they, they kept him on reserve PUP. That means he misses the first four games. So they've got two rookies, Kair Elam, who's a first rounder out of Florida and Christian Benford from Villanova is a six rounder. Those two guys will fill in. As we just said, the Rams are going to spread them out. They're going to go after those two young kids who are rookies. And this is why this game should be high scoring. I know week one sometimes fools you because sometimes the offenses are not in sync, but I'm telling you, they're going to go. You, you know that if I'm Sean McVay and Liam Cohen, the OC, you already know this. You're going in knowing in this game that they've got a major advantage here. And go after that those corners here, and I expect them to do that. Dane Jackson on the other side. This to me is a major advantage, and uh, the over under you you got to look at the over here. And the, the Bills though they were the top pass defense from last season. This is going to be hard for them for the, through at least the first four games. And why I believe uh, the Rams have a major advantage here in this matchup. I mean, uh, listen, I respect that these kids are talented, but they're going to get eaten alive by Cup and Robinson. There is no way yep. that you can tell me some no-name fifth, sixth-round draft pick can guard Cooper Cup or Allen Robinson you. in an NFL game. They are going to get shredded. They are going to throw the ball at whoever that is. If they have to start both of them, they're dead in that passing game. They're dead. They're oh, gonna, Cooper Cup, oh, yeah. he roasts. He would be able to roast White, who's the best corner in the league, yeah. and no one can stop yeah, Cup. He, yeah, he is unbelievable, and he has lost absolutely nothing. He, he obviously he set all all these NFL records last season. He's incredible. You know their offensive line isn't great, but it doesn't need to be. They just have to protect. Now 
This is also interesting, the debut of, of Von Miller on the other side. So we'll talk more about this Thursday, but this is a phenomenal matchup. I'm so glad that they have this game in SoFi. Uh, this, again, should be phenomenal. You don't have to worry about weather. And you got a matchup there, which we're going to talk more about on Thursday. But that, to me, tilts the – this absolutely tilts this matchup, the absence of Drew Davis White, the start corner for the Bills. How do you think his elbow will hold up through the season? Let's say, what do you think his elbow is going to be like week 10? See, that's – but what they'll do, Pharrell, okay, this is what – as I understand it, when – it would get sore, they'd back off in training camp. So what you do is you have three days of training camp, three days of practice in the regular season. Training camp, they, they, they'd back off. They'll back off when they need to. Unless it's unbelievably painful, he'll take it. He'll just take reps every day. So they'll they'll be careful with him. And John Lawford is a, is a better backup than uh, than you think. He's, he, he's a timing-based quarterback who's been with them for several years. They, they actually like him. He's a pretty good athlete. Little guy, though, about six feet. But obviously, that'd be a drop-off if Stafford can't play. But this is obviously something we're going to watch. We're going to watch this Thursday night, and, and it can't be underestimated. But just to, talking to a plugged-in team source, he's like really, really good throwing the football, Stafford. And he, they did the right thing. And he's also been honest with them when it hasn't felt right. Listen, if this guy isn't playing at the end of the season, they have no chance with Wofford yeah. to do anything, in my no opinion. Doubt. It's all about his elbow the whole season. That's the story to watch. We'll see you later in the week, Adam. Great stuff. Okay. Thank you. might be the next daily fantasy millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Fantasy Sports Today. Her cousins threw for 4,000 yards last year, 33 touchdowns. Essentially, he is a fantastic super flex quarterback. To have him as your number one super flex is fantastic. Do you see any drop back for him? I mean, Kirk Cousins has been a very good fantasy quarterback. I, I don't know if I would draft Cousins as a starter simply because I want to have a guy who can run, but I think he's a good option. The Sports Grid Network. The morning after. There are four of the five teams in the American League East in contention for American League playoff spots at the moment. And it's not the Red Sox, as we all assumed it would be entering the season. It's the Baltimore Orioles. Because when was the last time we could say the O's were even in postseason contention at this time? To start off the month of September, the Baltimore just keeps sticking around, keeps winning baseball games. And the Baltimore Orioles have been incredible. The Sports Grid Network. A-Rod, Clemens, Pettit, Bonds, McGuire, Sosa. Get ready, because that soup is served ice cold. From a betting perspective for the 2022 NFL season, if I'm betting on the 49ers in the futures market, I want Jimmy G on this roster because that instantly becomes one of the best backups he's taken to the Niners to the Super Bowl. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on SportsGrid. Sports Professor Rick Harrow inside the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your Sports News Minute seeing shifts to the West Coast with a joint venture that will benefit Sacramento. Sacramento Kings, Sacramento River Cats joining forces to take advantage of the synergies in sports marketing in that community. The Savage family, a very successful entrepreneurial group that created a ballpark in Sacramento that helped downtown development. And Vivek Ranadive, the owner of the Sacramento Kings, certainly has generated significant support. Remember when they were the Kansas City Omaha Kings and then the Kansas City Kings went to Sacramento, questionable possibilities. They've succeeded as much in the market, not necessarily on the floor. But the bottom line is both companies bring their assets to the state capital. And with gambling soon to be approved, the sky is the limit for a city that has a major league team and one that acts like one as well. Sports Professor Ricaro, Sports News Minute.
All right, fast forward, Pharrell on your face with the Pharrell finish. The Glazers put a $3.75 billion price tag on Man U, which could allegedly spark interest from owners in Dubai that would be interested in buying the Premier League club, the legendary Man U football team. Unbelievable. Jake Paul will fight Anderson Silva in a boxing match on October 29th in Phoenix. Eight rounds at 187 pounds. Everybody's saying that Jake Paul is finally going to fight someone. I'm not sure I, I believe that. Uh, Cyril Gaon, how about that knockout? Mafia called it over to Avassa. Beatdown in Paris. Tyson Fury is open to working with the WWE. JT Miller and the Canucks agree to a seven-year extension in Vancouver. Lonzo Ball, doubtful for the start of the season. Cam Newton's ex takes him to court over a $20,000 utility bill. Jesus Christ, $20,000. What are you doing, growing weed? <laughs> Who's got a utility bill that high? A-Rod single again after breaking up with Catherine Padgett. The blonde he sat courtside with at T-Wolves games. Study finds people who snore are more likely to get cancer. Carver High, you and I are doomed. Jockey Gerard Melanson arrested in Louisiana on uh, allegation of unnatural stimulation of horses. It's not sexual. They were saying that he's shocking them. Shock the monkey. Your boy Melanson giving him a little extra juice on the backstretch, Carver High. Argentine. Uh, they uh, suspend all football matches after their vice president. You see the guy try to come up with a gun and blow her head off. The gun wouldn't discharge. He tried to kill, assassinate the vice president from like two feet away. Former heavyweight boxer Ernie Shavers dies at 78. Let's me know how old I am. Bed Bath & Beyond executive identified as a man who jumped off a New York City skyscraper to his death in Manhattan. Ooh. Fiona Farrow says her former tennis coach, raped her multiple times when she was 15. A mistrial declared in the child sex abuse case against John Wetland. GTD is next. We'll see you tomorrow on Coast to Coast. Good night.